Hi everyone. Uh, today we've got an exciting uh, subject for us because we are discussing the impulse and momentum part two, where we will deal with two-dimensional collisions, we will deal with uh, the variable mass problems, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the tools you can use using the idea of center of mass. So without further ado, let's work on into the idea of a two-dimensional collision. Now, 2D collisions are sufficient for studying uh, everything in physics because we can always reduce any collision in three dimensions down to a single plane of collision defined by two velocity vectors. So this is kind of the necessary and sufficient uh, representation of the physics that we will have to deal with here in uh, basically forever. So to get started, we want to think about the idea of off-center or oblique collisions. We've dealt with kind of one-dimensional collisions uh, in the past. We want to consider now the general case of two objects colliding with each other. And we'll use round objects for now, uh, since everything can be kind of approximated with a, as a round object with an appropriate radius of curvature. Uh, but we're going to... Uh, when they actually collide. So what's going to happen is we're going to imagine the case where we have two uh, part, uh, two objects coming in with initial velocities VA and VB, and we'll give them a little subscript I to indicate that that's the initial uh, velocity, and then they're going to collide. And then they're going to bounce off. And so they're going to come out of this collision with uh, final velocities for VA and VB. So we'll use this as our general uh, notation. And uh, then we want to go back to the moment of collision. And when these objects are colliding, uh, what I've done is I've kind of returned the velocity uh, vectors and everything to the actual plane of, uh, or the moment of collision. I've drawn in the initial and final velocity vectors for A and the initial and final velocity vectors for B. And you'll notice that when they touch, uh, there is always going to be a plane of collision. And that plane of collision is going to be kind of the key point around which we're going to analyze our uh, physics problem here. So let's take away the balls and bring in the physics where we're examining the uh, plane of collision in terms of the initial and final vectors for the two. And then there'll be a couple of angles in here. We're not going to rely on these angles, but uh, they uh, often come in useful for analysis later, and we usually define those to the line that's perpendicular to the plane of collision, uh, or in the normal direction. And if we move into a set of normal and tangential coordinates, we can lay these out here where we have a tangential and a normal direction, and we can write down the physics for this case. Now, the key point here is that all of the collision is essentially a one-dimensional collision happening in the normal direction, and then nothing happens in the tangent direction. And then this is, of course, if the objects aren't spinning and there's no frictional coupling, this is just a straight on, they bounce off each other with no additional interactions other than the bounce. So, in this case, we can write down the equation for momentum, and what we'll do is we'll dot product that with the normal direction, which says that momentum is conserved in that normal direction. So what we'll be doing is we'll be breaking down our initial and final momentum or vector velocity vectors based on their normal and their tangential components. Then uh, we have a coefficient of restitution relation where we can apply this ex uh, exclusively in the normal direction. So only the velocity vectors in the normal direction uh, will matter. And then we also get that there is no momentum transfer in the tangent direction. So these velocity vectors moving in the tangent direction for the red and the blue ball here, those are unchanged before and after the collision. So they just kind of stay the same before and after. And this is going to allow us to reduce everything to a one-dimensional problem, uh, provided we have to sort of resolve the geometry of it. So let's take a look at two examples 
examples, one uh, kind of intermediate and then one advanced example. So this is the intermediate, uh, oops, um, this is the intermediate uh, collision right here. Let's uh, switch over to the intermediate collision. There it is. And describes a pool ball uh, A traveling with a velocity of 10 meters per second here uh, into an impact where it collides with ball B and then they fly off and we want to find the velocity of both balls just after their impact. And uh, we're going to say that's coming in at an angle of 30 degrees with respect to this plane of collision. And so what that's going to do is it's going to set up a normal tangential coordinate system like this, where we have a normal direction and then we have a tangent direction. We're going to have that the mass of the balls is the same, ma is equal to mb. And uh, to keep the notation a little bit more straightforward, I'm going to call the velocity vector of velocity vector of a, I'm going to give it the velocity, just the letter v, and then whatever happens to b afterwards, uh, it will have a velocity vector of u. So instead of VA and VB, just to stop the subscript nightmare, uh, I'm going to say that I'll call what happens to B, uh, B gets the velocity vector U, and then A gets the velocity vector of V. Now, I already know that my little drawing here is wrong uh, because uh, what happens is the initial, the tangent velocity of B, uh, final, so uh, I can just immediately write down that the final velocity in the tangent direction for B, so U tangent final uh, for ball B, is going to be zero because the initial tangent velocity of that is zero. So it critically, it is not moving up or down with respect to the plane of collision, so it must fly off in this direction. So there is no component, it is uh, just equal to zero. So that's the first thing I get. The second thing I get for block A, I'm going to have its velocity in the tangent direction, V T final, is going to be equal to the tangent velocity of ball A, initially, and then that is just going to be this vertical component of the velocity here, or I could measure it like this, and that's going to have, if this is angle is 30 degrees, that's going to have a component of uh, 30, sine 30 degrees. So we know that this is equal to 10 meters per second sine 30 degrees or five meters per second. So we already know two of our velocity components because they just don't change. Now the hard part is what happens in the normal direction. Uh, we have the relationship that the uh, momentum is going to be conserved in the normal direction. So in the normal direction we have momentum as conserved. So we know that the mass of ball A times the velocity of ball A initially in the normal direction plus the mass of ball B plus the velocity of ball B initially in the normal direction is going to be the mass of ball A times the velocity uh, final in the normal direction plus the mass of ball B times the velocity, oops, sorry, that should be a u because it's the final velocity of ball b uh, final in the normal direction. This is going to simple, simplify a bit. First thing I note is that the masses are equal to each other, and so that allows me to cancel out all of the masses. I also know that the ball b is initially at rest, so this term will go to zero. And so I am left with, after all this is done, that V initial in the normal direction is equal to V final in the normal direction plus U final in the normal direction. Now I also have the case that I know what the coefficient of restitution is. 
And so if I have a coefficient of restitution, I always know that the u final in the normal direction minus the v final in the normal direction over v uh, initial in the normal direction minus u initial in the normal direction is going to be my coefficient of restitution or 0 0.8. Again, I have that the initial velocity in the normal direction is 0. And as a result, I can just rewrite this expression to say u final normal direction uh, minus v final normal direction is equal to 0.8 uh, v initial in the normal direction. Okay, and now what I can do is I can add uh, this equation to this equation. And if I add those two together, uh, I will end up with add the um, initial uh, sides and the final sides. I end up with V initial normal plus 0 0.8 V initial normal is equal to add these up um, and then we get two oops sorry let me just be a little bit more explicit vfn plus u final normal direction plus u final normal direction minus v final normal direction again i'll get some nice canceling that was the whole point it's a two equations and two unknowns problem and i will get uh, out of this that 1.8 v initial normal direction is equal to 2 u final normal direction. And so uh, to find out the u final in the normal direction, uh, I have that as uh, 0 0.9 v initial normal. And so that's 0 0.9 times the initial velocity uh, or the initial speed, 10 meters per second and it's traveling in the negative normal direction. So this is going in the negative direction as we've defined it. So that's going to be negative times the cos of uh, 30 degrees. And uh, when I do all of that, I get an answer of, the answer there is minus 7.78 meters per second. And from there, I can go back and solve up here for the final, uh, which is just going to say that v initial, oh, so v final in the normal direction is v initial in the normal direction minus u final in the normal direction. So that's going to be uh, minus 10 meters per second cos 30 degrees minus a negative 7.78 meters per second and that will come out at 0 0.866 meters per second uh, also in the negative direction uh, so they both end up flying off uh, continuing through the plane of uh, impact uh, to the negative direction so this gives us the tools that we need to solve uh, a problem uh, in the sort of uh, solve this problem in a um, uh, sort of two-dimensional collision sense, applying the equations only in the horizontal direction. And uh, the case of bouncing shows up when we have objects sort of coming down and bouncing off a hard. Uh, object, and we will treat that hard object as having essentially an infinitely large mass so that whatever surface is uh, being encountered, it doesn't move. Initial and final velocity for that is going to be zero, and we also have the tangent velocity of the object is unchanged. So essentially what we'll do is we'll apply the coefficient of restitution rule and then the, um, the coefficient of restitution rule and the tangent uh, velocities to solve this kind of problem since we don't have a conservation of momentum because we're going to treat what the surface as having an infinite mass. And to make all that kind of clear, let's examine what happens if we have a ball falling down here in projectile motion that collides with a, um, 
There we are. That's better. Well, collides with a ramp here with an angle of uh, 30 degrees with respect to the horizontal. We want to know what the velocity vector is right after the bounce, if it's coming down, bounces off here with a coefficient of restitution of 0.6 and an initial speed right when it hits of 75 meters per second, or sorry, uh, of 3.0 meters per second. So what's going to happen is we have a normal tangential coordinate system that we're going to establish right here. And so that's going to be my normal direction and then my tangent direction down there. And let's actually write that coordinate system out so we can see in a little bit more detail what's happening. And uh, let's see here, normal, that's a tangent direction. And then we have a velocity vector that's coming in here at some angle. And it's 75 degrees below the horizontal, uh, as given here. But then this angle is tilted up by 30 degrees. And so the angle that it actually makes with the uh, coordinate system here is going to be this 75 degrees minus this 30 degrees. And so the angle between the normal direction and that one that's coming in there, the angle of incidence here, is just going to be 45 degrees and it's going to come in with a speed of 3.0 meters per second and then it's going to bounce off at some other uh, speed and some other angle. So let's figure out what that is all about. Uh, so we will apply the um, component of the velocity in the tangent direction is going to be the same as the initial component in the tangent direction, and that's going to be 3.0 meters per second times the, uh, let's see here, if this is 45, that'll be the sine of 45 degrees, and so that'll give me 2.12 meters per second. So we know that this velocity vector is going to have a horizontal component that is 2.12 meters per second. Then we apply the coefficient of restitution relationship uh, using the vertical component or the normal component. And so if we were going to write that down, we'd say that V final uh, in the normal direction minus U final, which is how fast the surface is traveling, uh, is going to be U initial in the normal direction minus V initial in the normal direction. And we have argued that the surface is infinitely massive, so those two uh, components are going to go to zero. And then the bounce velocity is just going to lead us to the V final in the normal direction is going to be minus 0.6 v initial in the normal direction and uh, it's coming down here in a negative 3.0 meters per second cos 45 uh, direction so the vertical component there so we can go ahead say v final normal is minus 0.6 times negative 3.0 meters per second times the cos of 45 degrees and so that's going to give me a velocity of 1.27 meters per second. And so that tells me that the vertical component here is going to be 1.27 degrees. And I can figure out what this little interior angle is as the um, uh, arc tangent, so the tangent inverse of uh, 1.27 over 2.12 is going to give me that this is uh, 30.9 degrees. And so the angle here is going to be 59.1 degrees. Uh, so because this is 30.9. So that gives me the complement. And so I know that the angle that comes out from the normal is going to be 59.1. And so that uh, we know that that normal is also tilted with a further 30 degrees with respect to the vertical. So in this plane, it essentially comes out at an angle that is tilted 30 plus 59 degrees or uh, so this angle is going to be relative to the vertical or the y-axis. The angle would be 30 degrees plus 59.1 degrees or 89.1 degrees uh, away from vertical. Vertical. And it's going to have a speed of 1.21 meters per second 
uh, squared plus 2.12 meters per second squared uh, square root. And that number will come out at 2.47 meters per second. So this is a velocity vector and I'm going to clear off all of my annotation and just sort of show you that the final velocity vector essentially comes out horizontally with a speed of 2.47 meters per second where this angle here is going to be 89.1 degrees or it's going to be 0 0.9 above vertical. It basically degrees basically shoots off horizontally once it bounces all right the next topic we'd like to dig into after finishing up collisions at long last is the idea of center of mass and the center of mass is a unique principle within physics because it allows us to treat all of the external forces acting on an extended object as if they are acting on the center of mass of the system. And as we move into rotations, we will break down the motion of a compound extended object into the motion of the center of mass and then the rotation of that around some rotation axis. So, we can consider uh, all the objects in a system, say this baby, uh, they are all feeling weight, but we are going to use the principle of the center of mass to say we will treat all of the forces as if they are acting on a single point and represent the baby as a single point particle. And so one of the great principles of the conservation of uh, momentum is that all of the external forces on the system just move where the center of mass is. We can calculate the center of mass as basically finding the average position of an object uh, given uh, using the masses of its components as weight. What that means is, in practice, if we have a um, symmetric uniform object, which means kind of constant density, then the center of mass sits at the center of the object geometrically. So uh, the spherical disk or something would have a center of mass at the center. A disk or a sphere would have the center of mass at its center. For linear objects, we often treat the uh, the object as kind of the balance point. So if you sort of imagine balancing at the point at which you can uh, it find the, uh, you know, an object under balance, that will be the point at which it, um, or that will be the point of the center of mass. And mathematically, what we do to calculate it is we establish a coordinate system, say from x equals zero over here. And then we measure the position of uh, the first object, and that's x1, the position of the second object, that's x2, and then we take m1 x1 times m2 x2, and then divide by m1 over plus m2, and that'll find the center of mass. And this has the property, if mass 2 is bigger than mass 1, it pulls the center of mass towards mass 2. For a general discrete set of objects for a vector set of positions, the position of the center of mass, whatever we've calculated it as, is the weighted sum of the position vectors of every one of the masses divided by the sum of the masses. And we often will transition into integral representations of this by saying that the position of the center of mass is going to be the integral over, and I'm going to use the notation lambda, is a linear mass density. So if this is a thin wire, it's the amount of mass per unit length in a wire in units of kilograms per meter, then we can actually integrate the position x over that uh, linear mass density and then divide by the total mass of the system, which would just be the integral of uh, this linear mass density. So we will later on in your physics career get to the position of the center of mass as the integral in these integral representations. Uh, for our purposes, we're mostly going to deal with the discrete cases um, here. And then we are going to treat the forces on those centers of mass uh, or the forces on the systems as if they are only acting on a center of mass. And so what's neat about this is that if we look at an extended object, 
uh, like a wrench that's spinning, there's actually this sort of black point in the center represents its center of mass. And it's sort of marked here on the wrench as it's spinning. And if you trace in this kind of stop motion photograph here uh, by Bernice Abbott, this beautiful set of kind of physics art photographs uh, by this artist, uh, and what she did was she, one of them is this sort of spinning wrench uh, uh, approach. And uh, so that, uh, if we trace out this uh, path, you actually see that it follows a uh, sort of projectile motion path or a straight line path in the absence of accelerations. Uh, so what's kind of neat about this is also like in track and field events, you have people flopping over the high jump bar. Uh, and one of the ways that they do that is they keep their actual center of mass by sort of pivoting their body over the bar. Uh, they keep their center of mass traveling below the bar, even though at every point in the jump, they're their sort of body kind of flops over the bar. Kind of basically, they flip around their mass, kind of like what this wrench is doing as they sail over the high jump bar. Uh, so I've actually traced out here the path of the center of mass, and you can see if you sort of connect the dots, literally, in this photograph, it follows a nice uniform uh, straight line. Uh, through that. So this is the genius part about center of mass, is that this extended object can be doing whatever it wants, but ultimately you only care about what happens to the center of mass, or the center of mass behaves like this beautiful Newtonian object. So to consider that, let's examine what happens for an exploding car. So we imagine this car sort of flying off this cliff, exploding in midair, action movie style, and then a part of the car falls down to the foot of the cliff, and then another part of the car sails onward. We want to know where this object ends. And the neat thing about this is that this is a case where the car has no external forces acting on it, so it behaves as if it is just a single object undergoing parabolic motion. And so the center of mass of the system will just follow a parabola on down, a la what we did in chapters two and three, uh, to land splat here on the ground. That is the center of mass of this position. And then we can figure out where this block is, uh, the big block, by knowing where the little block is and the center of mass. To, so the first thing we want to do is figure out what is the center of mass position. Uh, so we're going to set up a coordinate system in this problem where x and y equals 0 uh, right here. Uh, so this will be my origin point. Uh, and then I can write down my coordinates uh, following projectile motion is that the y at any given time is the height of the cliff, h, minus one-half gt squared, and we can solve for where that is equal to zero to figure out the time it takes to fall. That's root 2g, uh, uh, 2g, sorry, 2h on g uh, there. And then the x position of the center of mass is just going to be its initial velocity times that time, or v times the square root of 2h over g. And then we'll plug in some numbers, 30 meters per second, uh, times root 2 times the height, 200 meters over g, which is totally 10 today. Um, and then if we plug that all in, we get an answer of 189.7 meters. Uh, so that gives us our position, and that's the center of mass of this system. And then we can write out that the x of the center of mass is mass of 1 times the position of 1, mass of 2 times the position of 2, all over m1 plus m2. Um, the m1 is set up here so that that position is at 0 because x1 equals 0. And so we figure out that uh, x, uh, so this means that, um, let's uh, just write one more equality, that m2 over m1 plus m2 is e times x2 is the center of mass. We're solving for x2, that's equal to m1 plus m2 over m1 times the uh, center of mass, and that's equal to m1 plus m2 is 1600 plus 400, or 
2,000 kilograms over a M1, which is going to, uh, sorry, this is uh, M2, not M1, over 1,600 kilograms. And so that's going to be times uh, the position of the center of mass, which is the 189.7, so 189.7 meters. And if we plug that all in, we get 237 meters. So that'll give us the distance of the second chunk of the car from the base of the cliff. So remember that the next time you jump your car off of a cliff and have it explode on you. Important physics. All right, I think the final thing we should talk about today is the notion of variable mass problems. Um, because we wrote down a case for uh, Newton's second law, and we said that, oh, no, 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 no. Last week, Newton's second law says that the net forces on an object are uh, really just the change in momentum uh, with respect to time, or dp by dt. And so if we add mass to an object, that means that the mass will change. And so that's going to give me this second term, because I can take p, write it as mv, and then do a chain rule, or sorry, a product rule, uh, which says that m times dv by t, that's the uh, ma, mass times acceleration. And then we get the velocity times dm by dt, which is the changing mass of the system. And so we can add mass to an object, and depending on how we add mass to it, it can accelerate, decelerate, change its motion, or what, have, what have you. So let's consider some of the example cases. Um, Let's imagine what's happening to an empty freight car that is rolling along a railroad track that we will consider a frictionless motion. The top of the car is open and it's raining vertically. Uh, if it rains at a rate of 0.1 liters per second of liquid, of water being rain, into the car and it's initially traveling at 5 meters per second, what's the acceleration of the car? Well. We can figure this out uh, by using F equals MA, or F is equal to dP by dt. We have to ask, what are the external forces on this system? Well, the, uh, we want the acceleration in the x direction, but it experiences a normal force, it experiences a weight going down, and then the rain is going to be pushing down on it with some force uh, because there's water flowing into it. We're going to come back to how to deal with that uh, in a couple of uh, examples, but for now I want you to notice that the sum of the forces in the x direction is zero, and therefore this expression here is zero. So we want the acceleration in the x direction only. In the y direction, the normal force will balance out these two forces so that the acceleration in the normal in that direction will be zero. So if we expand dp by dt into m times dv by dt plus v times dm by dt, then we can figure out what the uh, actual acceleration is here. And so then we'll simply solve here by saying that uh, dv by dt is equal to negative v over m dm by dt. And so this says that the car will slow down at a rate proportional to the rate at which it is gaining mass. Similarly, if we were going to uh, pull mass out of it miraculously straight vertically, it would uh, speed up. So we can go ahead and substitute in some values here. So this is negative 5 meters per second over the current mass, which is 1,000 kilograms. And then we have to plug in the rate at which mass is adding. And so here I want you to throw your memory back to uh, chemistry class, uh, wherever that may be. And I want you to remember that a liter of water, one liter of H2O, has a mass of one kilogram. And therefore, this 0.1 liters per second of mass implies that dm by dt is 0.1 kilograms per second. So then we just write this as 0.1 kilograms per second, and then my deceleration is 0.0005 
meters per second squared. Notice that the kilograms cancel out, and I just get a meter per second squared in my answer. So I can figure out how the car decelerates just by asking how much mass gets added to it as it goes. Another great case of uh, variable mass problems is the case of a rocket. And rockets uh, out there, say, in the depths of space, operate by basically shooting mass out of their back ends. And if they shoot mass out of their back ends uh, and the uh, momentum is conserved, the remaining part of the rocket must fly forward uh, to conserve momentum. So if we imagine a rocket here that consists of a mass of a rocket plus a little chunk of mass of fuel, MF, and it's flying through space at a speed V uh, initially, and then it shoots that mass of fuel backwards with respect to it at some velocity of exhaust. And the typical velocity of exhaust for liquid fuel rockets is about three kilometers per second, 3,000 meters per second, uh, that it's sort of throwing material out the back. That means in the inertial reference frame that we are looking at it, this little uh, cloud of gas is moving forward at a speed of V, what it was launched at, minus whatever speed it was exhausted backwards at. And so it will basically be moving at a reduced speed. And then as a consequence, the rocket is going to increase its speed by a little bit of speed dV. Now we can write down conservation of momentum before and after for these two systems. So this is m plus dm times the v, that's this momentum here. And then that is equal to the mass of the rocket uh, at v plus dv, and then the little mass of fuel times v times uh, v minus vx. And then uh, what we'll do is we will take this and we will notice that there's an mv term over here, m times v, and then there's an mv term over there. And then what we'll do is we will uh, cancel those out. So we will say that this is m, oops, let's do this in my favorite colors, mv plus dmf times v is equal to mv plus mdv plus dmf times v minus v exhaust times d mass of the fuel. And then I'll notice a couple things. Uh, I can cancel out that mv with that mv and then I'm going to cancel out this VDMF term with this VDMF term, and I am left with this relationship that I can saw push this exhaust uh, times MF to the other side, and I arrive at this expression here. So the MDV is uh, the little bit of velocity times the mass of the rocket is the exhaust velocity times the mass of the fuel. But rockets actually get their mass by carrying it along with them and then throwing it out the back. And so we're going to make the assumption that the little mass of fuel that's in the uh, ejected there is going to take away mass from the rocket. So basically we throw it away and we lose a little bit of mass of the rocket. So we're going to assume that that mass of fuel is going to be removed from the rocket. And so we're going to say that DMF is negative mass of the rocket. So it's going to change the mass of the rocket as it flies out there. So with this association that the mass thrown out as fuel is the mass lost to the rocket, I get this differential relation right here. And then what I'll do is use this to figure out what happens as I throw a bunch of rocket fuel out the back and I go from some large initial mass down to some final mass. And in doing so, I'm going to speed up from some initial speed to some final speed. And the way we'll do this, we'll separate this equation uh, in terms of variables and then we'll integrate. And uh, when we do that, I'll take this um, VEX and divide it under, so I get negative VEX times uh, DV is going to be equal to DM divided by M. 
And what I'll do is I'll then integrate both sides of this. So I'll do one over VEX integral from V uh, initial to V final of DV is equal to the integral from M initial to M final of DM over M. Now, the left-hand side of this is easy. That's just integral of dv. And so, and then I plug in my final minus initial. So I get that that's equal to v final minus v initial over vex. Uh, that's great, because this is just integral of one times dv. And that gives me my v, plug in v final v initial. The Right-hand side is a little trickier. This is basically the integral of dx over x. That's the natural log function. And so then we plug in that this is the natural log of mass final minus the natural log of mass initial. And then that is, uh, from the rules of logarithms, the difference of a rule of log is the mass final over the mass initial. And then what I'll do is I'm going to divide both sides by a negative sign. And I'm going to remember more rules of log. So I get V final minus V initial over VEX, notice the negative sign is gone, is negative natural log mass final over mass initial. And the negative of a log is the log of the inverse of its argument. So that's going to be the natural log of mass initial over mass final. And it's going to be VF minus VI over VEX. And I'm going to write this as delta V, that's V final minus V initial, how much the velocity changes is the exhaust velocity times the natural log of the initial mass over the final mass. And since the initial mass is larger than the final mass, this is the log of a number that's larger than one, positive number times the exhaust velocity. So you get some multiple of the exhaust velocity as how much your rocket changes speed. And that multiple is, in a word, depressing because it's a natural log and logs are very weak functions. Let's consider a rocket launch for the Saturn V rocket, one of the largest rockets ever uh, thrown up into space. Uh, basically, this is the exhaust velocity down there, three, in, uh, three kilometers per second, throwing material out the back end of the rocket. And it has an initial velocity of three million kilograms or three uh, metric ton or one and a half metric tons. Um, and uh, its final is 1.5 times 10 to the 5 kilograms. So if I just take that my delta V here is my exhaust velocity of 3 kilometers per second times the initial 3 million kilograms over 150,000 kilograms, I calculate this all out and I get a delta V of about 9 kilometers per second. Nine kilometers per second is the speed that you need to essentially launch an object from rest on the surface of the Earth up largely into low Earth orbit, which is about eight kilometers per second. So this rocket uh, throws away 90% of its mass in the form of fuel, and it can lift itself into orbital uh, orbit around the Earth. Uh, that's not a very efficient process. Um, and it largely comes from the fact that a little bit of explosion has to lift all of the fuel plus all of the rockets, since you have to carry that along with it. That logarithm there kills you. Now, history aficionados in the audience will know that the Saturn V is the rocket that went to the moon. Uh, and, you know, you have all the little people up there in the top. So the key point of getting to the moon is that 90% of that remaining mass, the 150,000 kilograms, is another rocket. It's this second stage uh, and third stage of the rockets here. This is a staged rocket. So what you do is you launch up, throw away a little bit. And this is largely getting rid of the fact that you need for these tanks here. They cost mass and you don't want to be carrying those into space. So essentially you put a rocket into orbit and then that rocket takes you out to the moon and then it's fine rocket brings you back from the moon to earth so it's this massive multi-stage object that gets a tiny little uh, capsule all the way to the moon 
Rocket travel is depressingly hard. And the reason why it's depressingly hard is this natural log right here. You need to essentially throw away, the more of your mass you throw away, the better off you are at um, getting your fraction of the speed. The other thing that you'll notice is that, that uh, you get a multiple of the exhaust speed. And this is why things are on fire here at the end. Things are on fire because they then blast out of the back with higher speed. It uses the gas, the pressure of expansion of the gas to throw the material out back at the highest rate of speed. And so a lot of technologies in improving rocketry come in trying to figure out how to make that a bigger number. Because you will always get a constant multiple, in the case of Saturn V, about three times that as your speed. But if you throw material out at five kilometers per second, suddenly you're doing 15 kilometers per second when you're in orbit. So really, you want to make your explosion fast and you want to throw away most of your material and that'll get you your largest delta V. Uh, so there you are. Now you can go to the moon.